everyone. Welcome to the August 2023 New York Space Business Roundtable. We are excited to be having our end of summer reading list conversation. Um, first for us, and probably maybe will become a tradition. Uh, while you're in this space, you should be aware that you are going to be on mute for the entirety of the program. That said, the chat box is open. We actively encourage you to make use of the chat box to place any questions or ideas that you would like to put to the panelists in the chat box around the one o'clock mark that there will be an opportunity for you to, for your questions to be answered. So if they're in the chat box, we'll have a chance to put them to the panelists. With that, uh, welcome again. And I'd like to invite Lou Zaccarilla to the stage to bring us through. Well, thank you, Tamara. It's great to be on the stage. Um, Welcome, everyone. If it's the third Wednesday of the month, it must be the New York Space Business Roundtable. I'm Lou Zaccarella. I'm the Director of Innovation for Space and Satellite Professionals International. Um, as Tamara said, this is going to be probably the most fun episode we have this year, and um, we'll be doing some things that I think will move you to go to your local bookstore or online to do uh, some summer reading as summer closes here. So what do you do? when you have a nagging question rolling around inside your head. And the question is, is SpaceX a good idea? Or you wanna tell the story of how the rivalry of two men and their vast fortunes, egos and visions rekindled human exploration and the potential of colonization of space. Or you're an industry executive, well-renowned, and you have a fantastic idea for a novel about a mathematician on the verge of a scientific breakthrough, a way to harness the gaping blackness between numbers. Get your head around that. But something is hiding in the darkness. And as they say, it's just when the hijinks begin. Well, as creative people have done since the dawn of time, what you do is you tell your story. So listen, it's summer. And when people are asking those two August questions, what are you reading this summer? And will the Mets ever win another pennant? The New York Space Business Roundtable does have an answer. We have three authors with us today to discuss their works of fiction and nonfiction, all inspired by the greatest muses of all, space and commerce and the future. So we're gonna go right to the nexus of creativity inspired by, face, uh, by space, which has worked its way into the real world of ideas, policies, and great fiction and reporting. And as always, Joe Fargnoli, the founder of the New York Space Alliance, will give us his reaction, the nonfiction version, in our popular segment, The New York Minute, to close us. But before we do that, let me do a little bit of housekeeping for us. The New York Space Business Roundtable is supported by the people you see on your screen, and uh, we couldn't thank them enough for the support. The uh, Luxembourg Trade and Investment Office, Astroscale, Druva Space, our media partners at Space News, Empire Space, and of course, World Teleport Association. And um, by the way, those two guys in the slider are reading the books of our authors today. So Lou, what else are we doing? We, yeah, which shall we shall we do our warm up? Oh yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, as we always do, as we always do, uh, we open with a video that is relevant to our topic today. I think you're going to like this one. This is a, a gentleman, a fellow author um, of uh, well, a very well-known author who SSPI gave an award to a few, few years ago, and he's talking about the subject that we'll be dealing with today. So, Tamara, roll tape. In a long and an illustrious career, he has gifted the space and satellite industry with visions that inspire a never ending reach for the impossible. Or as he puts it, there is only one universal message in science fiction. There exist minds that think as well as you do, but differently. The SSPI is proud to present its first Inspire Award to science fiction author and visionary, Larry Niven. Congratulations, Larry. 
thank you so much for this award. Uh, I have been thinking of the uh, of other writers who who would have qualified for this. Uh, Arthur Clarke, of course, Robert Heinlein, and Arthur Clarke put uh, um, showed us the use of the Clarkian orbit, the 24-hour orbit for, for satellites. Uh, Robert Heinlein inspired everyone I know in the, in the science fiction writing field. Uh, I was thinking, though, of Jerry Pornell, my collaborator, who certainly would have qualified if, if he had survived another few years. Uh, Jerry was the spearhead of the, science, of the uh, Citizens Advisory Council for National Space Policy, which met at my house in the uh, 80s six times. We. Uh, we had a we we set forth to uh, write a space program for the Washington elite because they didn't seem to be doing anything like that. But Art Della wrote the paper. It was in lawyerese. Uh, I had the, the task of turning it into English. Uh, I was able to do that with Art Dulles standing at my shoulder so I could ask him what anything meant. Uh, we got it into shape that it could be read to Ronald Reagan. And, uh, and, and, and the result was, Star, uh, was Space Defense Initiative, which you may have known as Star Wars. Uh, <clears throat> that, that was, uh, Star Wars was one of our accomplishments. Uh, another was getting industry into space, and we did that finally uh, with the help of certain billionaires who were inspired by Robert Heinlein, I believe, because each of them seems to want to be uh, the, the man who sold the moon. Uh, the great Larry Niven uh, talking about the SDI initiative uh, as an act of imagination, really. And um, also, um, thanks to a writer, the president of the United States was able to actually read it. Um, and that, but just by the way, Arthur C. Clarke is, was the first chairman uh, of SSPI. He is our chairman emeritus, as is the man who introduced uh, Mr. Niven, uh, Chris Stott also uh, a past chairman, so uh, we thank them. But I think it, it sets the table for uh, what, what really takes place and the value uh, of the English language, of the language and writers uh, to our industry. So um, with that, Tamara, I think I can move on to Jason Rainbow, who's made it back today. Uh, Jason is here to provide some insights on writing as it relates to space journalism. Jason. Welcome to the this unique segment uh, Thank of you. Significant Digits. Yeah, it's a fun one today. It's good to be back. Um, yeah, where, where can I get a shirt like the one Larry is wearing in that video? That was amazing. I gotta get me one of those. Yeah, uh, Tamara's got it. She keeps all that stuff. They sign it for her and she, you know, she's got it at home. So maybe she'll- Tamara, share I'll be in touch. I'll be in touch. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, to um, hearing from some um, Really, really, really cool authors you got on, on the panel today. This, this might be controversial from a space journalist, but I, I don't necessarily seek out novels with a, a space theme. Most of the reading I do about it are articles, press releases, regulatory filings, white papers, court documents, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and I definitely don't get much time to sit down and read for leisure these days, but I am I am very fond of science fiction um, where the, the author not only you know, creates a, a world or, or worlds, but but really goes to town with with creating rich ecosystems that all kind of fit together and 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 make sense or or, or some some kind of sense at least. And you know, T Tolkien is a, a classic example of that because he went so far as to create the languages, some of the characters use, and the songs and other aspects of culture. And I think June by Frank Herbert is a, is a good one for epic world building with a, a lot of space. Um, very well known book. It's 
you know, as much about futuristic technology as it is ecology. But um, for my my summer reading list this year, uh, I'm hoping to pick up where I left off with the uh, Hyperion Cantos series by by Dan Simmons. Um, I've only read the first book, uh, Hyperion, a while back, and it and ends rather abruptly uh, after doing so much to <laughs> build really complex characters and, and stories that are kind of barely related to each other. So I'm surprised I haven't jumped back in yet with, with the rest of the series. Um, so along with the books by the authors on your panel course, I think Hyperion is one I'd, I'd recommend it. It follows a, a similar structure to the Canterbury Tales where each character takes turns to explain why they are on this, on this pilgrimage to a, a world called Hyperion that has these mysterious tombs that are somehow enveloped in this field that is uh, gradually going backward, uh, backwards um, through time uh, and are also guarded by this ferocious and uh, equally mysterious creature. It's it's pretty heavy to, to get into. And I, I think the same could be said for, um, for June, but uh, you know, it's a lot of rich world building in it that, that I liked and, um, and it does ramp up after a, a slow burn. Um, and then a non-fiction book I'm, I'm uh, hearing good things about that I'm hoping to read is uh, Lift Off, um, Elon Musk and the Desperate Early Days that Launched SpaceX by, by Eric Berger, who does such a great job reporting on the industry uh, for Ars Technica as their senior space editor. Um, is that one on your, on your radar, Lou? And it came out only recently, I think. No, it isn't. No, thank uh, you. Yeah, I've been meaning to pick it up for a while. I think there's a, yeah. There are quite a few books on a uh, similar topic, but uh, I'm hearing good things about this one. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I was just going to ask you, um, Jason, you've really set this up nicely because a lot of the stuff that, that you've read, you know, that sort of is, is running in your background, um, seems to be converging into the reality of the commercial space industry now. Um, as you look ahead in the fall and you look at sort of what you're going to be writing about, um, is there a, a headline that you're envisioning where you're going to, you, you would say, if I wrote that headline down now, I'll bet you by the end of the fourth quarter, it's going to be a reality. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> well, I know there's, there's one headline we're waiting for. Um, and that's, that's with what's happening with, um, with Viasat 3. Uh, I don't know if you, you're aware, this is a huge expensive one terabit per second broadband satellite that launched on a Falcon Heavy at the end of April. And it had some kind of antenna deployment issue some point after being successfully dropped off towards geostationary orbit. Um, some analysts were quick to just write it off as a, a total loss and it may still be that way. But the latest we've heard from Biosat is there's still hope they can get some capacity out of it somehow, um, even, even close to the capacity they were previously expecting uh, is, a, is possible, apparently. Um, engineers have managed to kind of communicate with the satellite and they expect to know by November how bad it really is and what contingency plan they're gonna go for and how that affects their fleet, uh, which I think is, I think it's 19 satellites now after merging with Inmarsat. Um, but anyway, yeah, there's big implications here for such a wide range of potential scenarios. Lots of multiple headlines that could come out of that one. Um, mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's in short for, um, $420 million. And that's that's a huge hit for the insurance market, um, which I imagine is putting a lot of pressure on rates. And I'm sure Rob at Willis, who is on your panel, is looking uh, really closely at that right now, too. Yeah. We'll, All we'll too ask familiar him. with it. Yeah, I yeah, bet. So, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, well, Jason, just to, just to close on that, um, do you think that it is going to be communicating? Do you think it's going to be able to deliver based it's on a, a, data that you have, of course? I am actively trying to find this out now. Um, you know, it's uh, I think on the uh, the last earning call state they they, um, they put out only recently. Um, yeah. There's you know, Mark Danbo, the CEO, said um, it's hopeful that they could even communicate with the satellite and get an end to end tests out. Um, but I've heard stories of engineers doing remarkable things to kind of fix this, you know, shake, uh, shaking the satellite, putting getting it uh, putting it uh, heating it and cooling it rapidly to kind of get things kick started. There's all kinds of things that um, engineers are far more knowledgeable than me they're gonna, can kind of do to correct things in space. Because for now, for now, we can't send a you know, servicing probe up there to, to with robotic arms to, to fix uh, these kinds of things on orbit, but that is also coming. And that's also yeah, yes. a feature of many science fiction books. 
Exactly. Well, I think it's going to be a topic of a roundtable in, in the not too distant future. And we have talked about things like that. Hey, Jason, um, thank you so much. And hopefully with your little one, um, you're able to at least get to the beach and, and finish off Hyperion. Oh, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah, she does make it uh, very challenging. <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I look forward to watching the panel. Great to see you. Thanks again. Take and that's care. Jason Rainbow for Space News Magazine. And we thank him. Okay, let's. It's time to uh, meet our guests, and let me just go in, in alphabetical order here. Um, we're just delighted to have this group of writers with us today. Uh, we, it's just the ideal program for Joe and Tamara and I. Um, first up is uh, Christian Davenport. Christian is a staff writer at the Washington Post, where he covers space for the financial desk. He was on a team that won the Peabody Award and has been on reporting teams that have been finalists for the Pulitzer Prize no less than three times. He is the author of um, several books, uh, two, two in particular, uh, the space, actually two books, um, The Space Barons, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and The Quest to Colonize the Cosmos, his most recent, and before that, As You Were, to war and back with the Black Hawk Battalion of the Virginia National Guard. He's a frequent commentator on television and radio, he was the producer of Space, The Private Frontier, which is a documentary that aired on the Discovery and Science channels. And he's a producer and co-host of Space Launch Live, the network's first live broadcast of SpaceX's first crewed mission, which also uh, garnered an Emmy Award in 2021, and I believe was the highest rated non-primetime telecast in that network's history. So uh, we welcome him today, Christian. Thank you for making the time to be with us. Sure. Thanks for having me. Tim Fernholz is a senior reporter at Quartz, where he covers the intersection of economics, politics, and technology. He is the author of the 2018 book, Rocket Billionaires, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and the New Space Race. Uh, Tim's interests are wide-ranging, as you would imagine, uh, with uh, for a person of his creative uh, background and capabilities. Uh, but they include utopian macroeconomics, the life of the mind, dangerous technology, the politics of institutions, the history of cocktails, which we have to ask him about, and one of my favorite uh, musicians of all time, Thelonious Monk. He lives in Oakland, California. Uh, Tim, welcome. Thank you so much. And we'll have to hear more about cocktails later. Um, you know Rob Scheiger. He's a senior executive at Willis Towers Watson uh, Rob was on our June roundtable, and he's graciously um, decided that he would make the time to come back uh, to be with us. He's responsible for business development and client management for all satellite, launch vehicle, and space technology accounts uh, here in North America. Rob's focus areas include risk management, insurance program design, loss formulations, statistical analysis, contract and financial analysis, and export control, among other things. He has expertise managing risks for satellites in LEO and uh, GEO, ranging from single spacecraft to the mega constellations. For the purposes of you SSPI people, he was named a future leader of the space industry in 2009 by SSPI. We know talent when we see it. And he's also been recently named a power broker by Risk and Insurance Magazine. He's the author of three novels, including The Ubiquitous They, which we're gonna talk about a little today. And he's also a, a new father as well. Rob, welcome. Thank you for the award back in 2009 as well. It was, okay, that same year. Well, again, it's good to see all of you guys. Um, let me just start with some questions. In the video that Tamara shared uh, with, uh, with us of David Niven, he describes in, in his own way, the nexus of creativity fueled by that muse of space. When applied to scientific engineering, there's clearly been an impact uh, on, quote, the real world. Now, you guys each seem to come at this subject in a different way and, of course, for different purposes. Uh, Tim, I'm going to start with you. You said at one point in your book, Rocket Billionaires, uh, that it began as an attempt to answer the question, is SpaceX a good idea? Is SpaceX a good idea? Now, it's a pretty provocative thought in 2023, and it runs against the grain of at least popular thinking. 
in the financial community and culture at large where uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX are seen as cultural icons, fantastic ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, why did you need to answer that question? Uh, you're right. It does seem a little strange today with Elon being the world's richest man and in the news for something every 10 seconds. But a decade ago, uh, he was not those things. Um, when I started writing about SpaceX, uh, Falcon 9 had launched, but we hadn't really seen the orbital cargo program go into full effect. We hadn't seen commercial crew. We hadn't seen reusability. We hadn't seen the Falcon Heavy. And there were real questions if NASA could make a program work partnering with a private company. Would it be a waste of money? Uh, this is a time when the rest of the aerospace industry, especially competitors like Boeing and United Launch Alliance, were looking back incredibly smug about what they saw as a bunch of jokers blowing stuff up uh, and not, not really doing anything they thought was very groundbreaking. This was a time when George Sowers, who was an executive at ULA, would write white papers about how reusability, even if it was technically feasible, would never close as a business case. Um, and, you know, there were also sort of questions about what is the role of private companies in space? Will there be an economy in space that can actually support somebody with a commercial focus? Uh, and then in 2015 and 2016, we saw Falcon 9s explode. And it was a real question. Is this a company that will actually succeed or not? Uh, and we have seen them do that in recent years. Uh, but I do think it's interesting now to think about whether it is a surprising question to ask whether or not SpaceX is good, because now we're sort of asking that question in a different way. The New York Times had a big feature on Starlink last week, SpaceX's internet satellite network, that sort of question, should any one person or company control a communications network uh, like Starlink that is, for instance, relied upon by Ukraine as it fights off Russian invasion? Um, I think people are now concerned, not that SpaceX will fail, but that it is too dominant of a monopoly and that the U.S. military, U.S. civil space, and basically Western aerospace industry is dependent on just one company. Um, so it's very interesting, the questions that have changed from whether or not SpaceX is ever going to succeed to now whether it is too successful, and maybe from a financial perspective, whether or not it's a bubble. Uh, we've seen Elon Musk's fundraising prowess. This is an incredibly valuable company. But we also know that it's a company that has made some very risky bets on new architectures, on a new spacecraft that may or may not pay off uh, in the years ahead, especially if a, com if a competitor ever emerges. Uh, so even though it seems like a silly question now, a decade ago, it was definitely a very interesting one, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, before I uh, ask the next question, I'm, I'm going to ask Christian this one. Uh, Tim, you know, having having spent so much time uh, thinking about and writing about the company, you move from, you know, sort of uh, vulnerable in one area in the entrepreneurial space, so to speak, to now uh, looking at an, what is effectively more than an entrepreneurial company, an institution that is making everybody else vulnerable. I mean, is that is that a subject that um, that concerns you or when you look at it from the financial perspective should be concerning people and, and, and specifically uh, why? Well, I think from a financial perspective, any investor or executive will tell you it's very nice to operate a monopoly. It's very yes. good for your margins. It's very good for the bottom line. And the question is whether that's good for the industry as a whole. If you ask people at NASA who are depending on SpaceX's Starship to put astronauts on the moon, they are not very happy that they can only depend on one company to do that. And if you ask the Pentagon, if they're happy that right now they only have one real vehicle to launch military satellites, they're not really thrilled about that either. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind, just from an industry and ecosystem perspective, is that the lowering the cost of access to space that Elon and SpaceX have promised has not really been realized on the scale that people imagined five or six years ago. And that's mm -hmm. largely because SpaceX has no real competition when it comes to orbital launches. And so if the dream of a thriving space economy is something that we embrace, we need to see the price of going to space go down. And that's not going to happen as long as Elon has a monopoly. Interesting. Um, because I that that's really interesting. Thank you for setting us up that way. Um, Christian, um, 
you know, certainly feel free to respond to Tim. Um, and I can see Joe Fargnoli writing notes. Um, like Tim, you took on a related theme or topic in your book, The Space Barons. Um, I note that the title includes words like barons and, and colonization, which have a range of connotations and, of course, triggers today. But you've done years of reporting and in interviews with our industry's billionaires uh, and have done the deep dive as your colleague Tim has. What does your book tell us about that rivalry, their relationship to the rest of the industry, vendors, established companies, and how their disruptions have moved them both closer to the goals and maybe created the kind of vulnerability that, that Tim started us off talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the question that my book posed is, can this commercial space industry exist? Can it erode the government's uh, decades-long monopoly on space exploration? Can it carve out a niche to work uh, along with government or eventually independent of of governments. And uh, we're seeing that come to fruition and in fits and starts and in some ways very successful and in some ways not at all. Um, I mean, I think the government is still uh, uh, dominant in a lot of different ways, both on the civil side and the national security side. But you are beginning to see, you know, a little bit of a commercial marketplace. And, you know, uh, us in the media, we, we focus on uh, big rockets and and astronauts, but the the commercial space industry is a lot more than that. Um, and we're beginning to see some of these companies come onto the scene. Um, you know, I thought I I thought you know Tim's question and his book is is fantastic, and I recommend it to to everyone. Um, you know, this idea uh, if you if you follow the arc of SpaceX from this company that, you know, Elon was going to give a one in 10 chance of succeeding and now growing even further and starting things like Starlink, which he also said, you know, this is a huge bet, a risky bet. It, it, it may fail. It may never come to fruition. Um, and now they're in this dominant position, which they weren't, you know, 10 years ago. But the interesting thing is that's obviously due to their success, but it's also due to the fact that they, their competitors have failed. Boeing is not launching astronauts. Amazon, which is going to be, says it's going to launch its Kuiper satellite to rival Starlink, is not there yet. Um, you just haven't seen, you know, these big other heavy launch vehicles come around. So they do have a monopoly. They've moved fast. They've dominated the market. But it's also the failure of other uh, players in the industry, as Tim, you know, noted, who sat by smugly and sort of let this happen to themselves. Mm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think SpaceX in, in a way is, is an outlier and we have, you know, so the question is, is there a commercial space industry or is there just SpaceX? That's one way to think about it. Right. So, so would you say com com the commercial industry is a good idea? SpaceX, maybe, maybe not. Um, well, it's just it's you know they're they're you know going back to your point about the words like colonization, right? You know that's that is that does carry connotations. But remember, we're talking about private enterprise here. We're talking about private businesses who, yes, I do believe you know care about exploration and and moving humanity into the cosmos. But what they're driven by is the bottom line. These are businesses, right? And they don't always have to adhere to you know rules in terms of. You know, uh, you know the way a government enterprise may go about these things. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that that those terms like that sort of get at some of the tension that we see when you have a collision of a private enterprise uh, entering a space that had been uh, really a public sphere for so long. So, so really, we're talking about different philosophies of of why we exist. Governments exist to enable, to provide uh, a public good. The commercial industry is to generate the kinds of profits and innovations that advance society in their way. Uh, if I'm if I'm reading you correctly, um, I have to ask you about the rivalry, though. How much does the rivalry between these guys and the way they keep score feed into, you know, the way they they approach things? Does it does it create a certain recklessness? I mean, like where they might want to even fight each other, <laughs> or 
What, what did you find? Well, I guess Jeff Jeff does work out a lot, so um, I, but he he's been maybe mature enough to to not enter the ring. Um, again, like like Tim's book, when it, when you started out reporting this, you did see the beginnings of a rivalry, particularly between Elon and Jeff and SpaceX and Blue Origin. I think it's fair to say that now, uh, you know, SpaceX is really dominated and it's so far ahead. Um, you know, that said, Jeff is obviously very committed to this. Um, they tweeted a picture about all the hardware, you know, in their factory. Uh, they won a lunar lander contract. Um, you hear some talk uh, about, you know, how difficult these architectures are, both Starship, the, the SpaceX lunar lander that's under contract from NASA and, and what Blue Origin is trying to do and that there might actually be a race for the moon. Um, but what's been interesting to me is to see how that rivalry in a sense has changed. And I think Blue Origin is moving into areas that SpaceX isn't. Uh, SpaceX dominates launch. Blue Origin is, seems to be much more focused on developing some of the technologies needed to sustain a human presence in space for a long time. So for example, they recently won a contract to turn lunar regolith into solar cells. Uh, they acquired a company called Honeybee Robotics, you know, sort of a mining company. Um, they're involved in uh, Orbital Reef, a commercial space station. And so it seems like they have a more diverse portfolio. Um, what they haven't really done yet so far really is to execute and, and deliver on any of that mm -hmm. in a meaningful way. Yeah. Um, and, and I want to circle back on what that next evolution of these business models would be with you guys uh, in a second. Um, speaking of business models, Rob, there are enough of them evolving out there to, to certainly keep you up at night um, and keep you guys busy uh, at, at uh, Willis Towers Watson. But it's fitting that one of the space industry's preeminent insurance company executives would, you know, sort of get away maybe and write about mysteries lurking in the numbers. Uh, in the darker places, let's say, uh, as it relates to your book. Um, I, I want you to respond to what your two colleagues have said. But first, tell us about uh, the ubiquitous state plot line and how it came about to you as an inspiration. Um, is, is writing a work of fiction, which uses space and exercise and letting the right side of your brain have some equal time, while the left side says, wow, it's a, it's a wild industry today? Yeah, thank you. It's uh was a bit of a, di a diversion here because the other two authors here have been spoke have been speaking about uh, like the real world, and I'm going to go into a fictional universe now. But um, uh, to answer the question, the, the inspiration for the for the book really came from a few books that I read about a gentleman called uh, Georg Cantor, a German mathematician, and uh, his work in a uh, branch of mathematics called set theory. And I, I found it fascinating in particular how he proved that there's different levels of infinity. Some are bigger than others. So um, this is a mathematician. We'll say this example is not accurate, but we have the set of even numbers, which is infinite, the set of odd numbers, which is infinite. They're, they're the same amount of infinity. But if you say, well, what's the set of whole numbers? It should be a size of infinity that's double what each of the other infinities are. Now, again, that's not technically accurate, but it gives you an idea how you can have different levels of infinity. So one of the biggest, if not the biggest type of infinity is the set of irrational numbers, which is the numbers like pi that everyone knows that can't be defined in, in absolute term, in absolute terms. So um, in a way, the very existence of these numbers, it demonstrates that mathematics, which is the best language that we have to describe nature, is fundamentally flawed because, because you could calculate until the end of time and never be able to define pi in absolute terms and with, with pure precision. And you know, it's, it's probably one of the most, to use the term, ubiquitous uh, numbers in all of science. And there's an, there's an infinite number of pi-like values out there. Uh, they're everywhere, everywhere you look. So I had a thought one day that you know, we met some advanced interstellar alien. They might say, oh yeah, you know, math, we, we tried that. Now let me show you how the world really works. In other words, maybe there's a more accurate and, and truer way to describe nature that maybe we haven't discovered or invented or even have the physical capability to to comprehend. So much in the same way that a turtle could never understand any kind of number system because it just doesn't have the biological structures in its brain to allow it to do so. Maybe there's things that we just can't grasp. And you know, to think that 
humans are the apex of what's biologically possible from an intelligence perspective is probably a little bit egocentric and i think it's it's much more a little bit or not so um anyway about the book uh the the plot focuses on a, a mathematician who conceives of a, a new way of uh a new fundamental property of irrational numbers and in the process of doing so she finds herself at the precipice of let's say the the next step in human understanding so she discovers that there's something deeper something far more fundamental and true and in the process of doing so uh she enters this forbidden place uh it's a sort of an intellectual trespassing if you will that unleashes a dark force that's been hiding beneath somewhere in the space between the numbers and she calls attention to herself by something much more powerful than than, than she could ever understand and that's really the premise of the novel um the 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 plot line has two narrative arcs, uh, the world before and the world after. And right. uh, before and after a big apocalyptic event, the world before follows that mathematician and her family in the uh, the immediate days after her discovery and all sorts of crazy things unfold with her and her family. And the story is told from the perspective of the, the different family members that they watch all this crazy stuff happening to them. And then the world after is uh, post-apocalyptic and the reader follows the mathematician as she's traveling a destroyed world. Uh, the, the moon's orbit is off kilter, the sun is reddening and expanding and uh, the earth is shaking and wildfires are everywhere you turn. And um, as the story progresses, the reader comes closer and closer to discovering what happened between the world before and the world after. And that's the main mystery of the novel, which I'll probably stop there for the sake of not spoiling it. Yes, and yes. If I could just add one more thing. Sure. Hyperion which Jason was talking about it in his opening yeah. remarks there. That's my favorite novel. So I strongly recommend it to everybody after they read my book first. Yeah, yeah but they got, they've got to read your book now because you set it up uh, or, or see the movie. You know, it's interesting because earlier in the summer, I was re rereading Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut. And, you know, the Trelfamadorians, right, where they, they, be, they allow him, the, the character, to become unstuck in time. Uh, you wouldn't think that that would be that kind of an adventure, but you've you've got the same thing in your book. It really is a great great adventure story too. Um, so there's a lot of drama there, and uh, as you say, we uh, we kind of get become unstuck in time and, and look at behind and ahead through it. So uh, it, it, terrific, terrific book. And you know, as you say, uh, you hope you get the time to write another one now that you're uh, spending a lot of time as a father. But uh, thanks for that. Um, you know you. You each uh, deal with mysteries of a type. Um, Tim, there are mysteries within the billionaire-inspired companies, uh, I'm sure, that um, have not been uncovered. Are there things that have evolved now, as you've seen the commercial industry begin to play itself out, that you say, I, I think we need to look at this because it, it too might reveal something hidden in the numbers, to use a phrase of Rob's? Yeah, sort of to get at what Christian was sort of asking about. I think the big question we all want to know the answer to is, will another private space-focused company actually succeed? Or is it just SpaceX, which is some special thing on its own? Uh, since we're talking about books, I'll plug another book. Ashley Vance's new book that's out, When the Heavens Went on Sale, looks at four space startups uh, that are in the wake of SpaceX and trying to start satellite Earth observation businesses, build small rockets, um, and sort of the travails they go through. Um, and it's a fascinating book, great story. Uh, but none of those companies are profitable yet. Um, and some of them are in dire straits. So it's an open question. You know, I was speaking to a, an investor here in Silicon Valley the other day, and they were saying, you know, there's been a series of technological innovations, whether it's the cost of launch going down, thanks to reusability and the various things that SpaceX has leveraged, whether it's CubeSats and how that has opened up satellite activity to new actors or big data that lets us take all the information from space and make use of it. But it's not really clear what the next big innovation is that's going to drive space companies forward. Um, you know, a lot of what we're seeing now are new sensors, it's space radar, it's hyperspectral, or things that are maybe a little uh, not quite there yet in terms of like commercial space stations or asteroid mining or lunar economy stuff. So I think for anyone who's thinking about the business of space, the question to ask yourself is, 
what is the next innovation? What is the next business model that's actually going to drive the sector forward? Yeah, that, and th thank you for doing my job because that was actually the question <laughs> I did want to ask you and, and Christian. Um, Christian, to Tim being the great reporter that he is, set it up for me. Um, I mean, to kind of answer that question, what my question is: what what is going to be the next evolution in the in the commercial space? The one that that is being uncovered now that that again gets you excited. Where where's it? Where does the approach look like it's coming from? Well, I mean, like I said earlier, and, and, and here I'm talking about exploration and not, you know, the business sense. I think from a business standpoint, you would have to point to, you know, satellites and satellite technology and the advancements there. But in terms of exploration, you know, like I said, we focus so much on, on the astronauts and the big rockets, uh, but we don't pay as much attention to uh, the power generation on the moon, for example. Right. Um, uh, ISRU, I mean, living off the land, getting the resources that we need uh, from the lunar surface or from an asteroid, um, the manufacturing in space, habitats, uh, transportation, um, you know, storing of power, not just generating power, but storing it. Um, all of those things that are needed to sort of create a more sustainable presence. And, you know, it's easy to talk about NASA's Artemis program and you know how it's different from Apollo and we're not gonna leave flags and footprints, we're gonna build a more sustainable presence on and around the moon. And you know, Jeff Bezos likes to say, you know, we're going to the moon this time to stay and Elon you know, has wanted to go to Mars for a long time. But you, know, you think about actually sustaining human life in these places and it's incredibly difficult um, yeah. and, and harrowing. I mean, you talk about Mars, for example, I mean, Jeff likes to say, you know, uh, Mars makes Antarctica look like a garden paradise, but it's almost like, you know, you, you got to add a Chernobyl in there too. I mean, it's, it's, it's as a, a, a colleague of mine, Joel Achenbach said, I mean, imagine you have a Mars mission and it goes perfectly. Everything goes right. Entry, descent, landing, the seven minutes of terror, and you are on Mars, the first human landing. And in that moment, you are only in a crisis mode, right? Even though it went perfectly, it's it's these things are very, very difficult. And I think that um, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of developing the technologies that will need it so that, you know, uh, you know, deep space or the moon or Mars doesn't kill us outright because that's what they're trying to do. Yeah, and it, and it can, it is a, a dangerous frontier. So building the technologies, the infrastructures, to enable all of that is is a sizable task, but again, you know, it is ripe. Uh, I think for entrepreneurs, um, you know, just just to stay with that a second, Christian and, and and Tim as well, and then I'll come to Rob with another question. Um, Jeff has spoken, I think, more than Elon maybe about the technology of commercial space enabling the Earth to do better. I mean, one proposition of Starlink is that the middle of nowhere becomes no more. Uh, and so anyone can live anywhere they want and participate in a global economy. First time in human history we've ever been able to approach anything like that. Uh, well, that has the effect possibly of stabilizing the places that people have fled because their economies were shattered. They didn't have access to the information superhighway and so forth. Um, are there, Christian, I'll stay with you and then we'll go to Tim. Um, are there things that you've written about or envisioned or heard of within the context in which you were speaking that could be beneficial uh, to people right here on earth where it's, it's dangerous enough when you cross the street in New York, but not as dangerous as landing on Mars. Right. I mean, I, I think it's somewhat of a, of a cliche for space companies that talk about, you know, we go to space to, to benefit the earth. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, some of that is overblown. Some of it is true. Obviously, that little blue dot on the GPS on your phone comes from a satellite. There are enormous benefits uh, there. I mean, going forward, um, I mean, to take it away from, from Jeff and Elon for a minute, because they tend to dominate the headlines and, you know, things like mining asteroids for resources and going to space to generate power. Um, you know, I had an interesting conversation with a Space Force General, uh, General Purdy, who I think is, you know, sort of on the tip of the sphere and, and, right. and lives in a world where, you know, he's trying, like Elon and Jeff and others, trying to make science fiction reality and talked about, um, 
you know, why can't we have on orbit depots where, you know, like the, the Marines, if they're, you know, going into a country, they would, you know, um, pre-position supplies. Well, you know, say you have supplies in orbit, in space, and then there's a hurricane or a typhoon or a natural disaster, and those supplies need to be delivered at a moment's notice, you deorbit them from space. Um, and I thought, you know, sort of concepts like that are are really interesting and, and um, you know, how the, the, the Pentagon in a lot of ways is looking to this. Uh, there was, I, I didn't spend a lot of time with it, but I noted there was a, a paper from, from DARPA uh, the other day talking about, um, you know, sort of the, the space economy, which was sort of an interesting juxtaposition to have, you know, an arm of the Pentagon um, talking about, you know, how space can benefit the earth. Yeah. Um, and I'll just end on one quick point. When we talk a lot about, you know, these technologies and the private enterprise doing it, I mean, I think yes and no, because there's somewhat of a limit, right? I mean, they've got to do it, but they also have to make money. And you sort of wonder what is the financial case for a lot of these endeavors? And, you know, are they really going to make a business case close? Fair enough. Tim, um, you know, uh, Christian, you know, refers to it possibly as a cliche, but then, you know, as always, he eloquently gets us into you know, let, let's take a look, a deeper look at this. Um, it seems to me that Earth is at least a market, right, for some of these services. But um, is it really? Um, or are we kidding ourselves when we think that commercial space is going to boost the, the quote, space economy uh, for Earth? And what do, you, what do you find out when you do I this? mean, if commercial space doesn't boost the space economy, I don't know what will. But, you know, Christian is right that you really have to look at the different categories of businesses. There are some of these space startups that are entirely predicated on the Pentagon or NASA giving them money, and they don't really have a business strategy. But if you're looking at Earth observation and telecommunications, that's a real service that has made billions of dollars for people over the past decade, and I think it will continue to. Um, there are things that people are talking about that in terms of in-space manufacturing, particularly of advanced electronics or pharmaceuticals that maybe could pay off and bring real gains to the world below. Uh, at the same time, that kind of research has been going on for a long time now, and we haven't always seen the payoffs. Um, I think it's good that we have a science fiction author on this panel because a lot of space entrepreneurs are inspired to try and do things that have not been done before because of that. I think we're going to see a lot of companies go out of business, a lot of space startups. But the nature of capitalism is that people are experimenting and trying to figure out what works. And even if, you know, the most insane realizations of space visionaries are not going to be delivered by the space economy, Starlink is pretty cool. I think we will have in the next five to 10 years, global satellite internet constellations taking on a huge share of communications and that's gonna have important impacts and it's not nothing, uh, but it's not Mars colonization either. Yeah, okay, well said. Um, Rob, as, as the fiction author alluded to, I'm gonna actually you know, go back to your desk at work. Um, you know, what, what we've been talking about uh, is this enormous expansion, all of these, it, capitalism at its best, really. I mean, you know, things are just just beginning to blossom and bloom in, in all directions. But what makes you anxious about where the commercial development of the industry is headed that might give the investment community or, you know, and you guys a chance maybe to alter the course in a corrective way? Yeah, so I would say the, the main issue, at least, in our corner of the industry, the space insurance that we're seeing now that I, I'm not quite sure how we're going to grasp really is, mm -hmm. is a huge gap in mission values, right? Because at the end of the day, insurance, it's a financial product. So we have to look at it from that perspective. Um, you know, historically, the industry has been really fine-tuned to respond to risks like the large geospacecraft that are valued in the 250 to $300 million range. And over the past several years, and it's happening more and more as, as time passes, we've seen fewer and fewer emissions in, in that price range or value range. Um, you know, if it wasn't for the C-band satellites that you know, we all know about, it would be even fewer than that. Instead, what we're seeing is a multitude of emissions that are in the very low 
a value range. And you're talking, you know, the single digit millions or sometimes even in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, I, I might, uh, Tim made some comments earlier about the barriers to, to entry for space not changing or not changing as much as they should have. From my perspective, I think SpaceX has actually lowered the barriers of entry, particularly with their transport emissions, because I really don't think that a lot of these missions that are, you know, a satellite that's worth $100,000 or even, you know, $10 million, they may not have found a way to space uh, but before those missions were available to them. Um, but, you know, we can we can take that that conversation off offline anytime. Um, but, you know, so they have all the, the lower missions. And on the flip side, you have these missions with just massive values, right? We, we talked about Biosat earlier today. Um, you know, there's there's stuff coming down the pike that are valued half a billion, you know, some Earth observation satellites, for example, half a billion or more. Right. Um, you know, you have uh, some of these servicing missions have high values. Some of the upcoming, you know, commercial space stations will be valued in the billions. So in the very near future, we're going to have these very small values and these massive values and nothing really or very few risks in between where the market has historically over decades and decades and decades been fine-tuned to respond to. So why is that a problem, right? So this, this bifurcation becomes a problem because from an insurance perspective, if you're an underwriter, now I'm a broker, but, um, but from an underwriter's perspective, the ones that are actually taking the risk on their books they want to have a consistency of values in their portfolio. They want to have roughly equal dollar amount as close as they can have across the board for all risks, or at least same percentage values. If as an underwriter, you have a ton of very low valued risks, and then a very small number, a handful of these extreme high value risks, your portfolio becomes unbalanced. And mm -hmm. of course, if you have a claim on a high valued risk, you have this spike in your book and you're probably not going to have the premium income to withstand that loss, maybe even on a multi-year perspective or time frame. So in theory, it could knock you out of the business if that were to happen and you have a significant contraction of the industry. Then what happens is the rates go up for those that are remaining because you have a econ 101 supply and demand uh, dynamic happening. And it becomes problematic for everyone. Then all of a sudden, space becomes more expensive. And maybe the barriers of entry that we were talking about change because of the insurance availability and whether or not investors are going to be willing to allocate capital to to that uh, the entire sector. So, you know, to answer what do we do about it, I'm not sure. Um, you know, we we have some 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 ideas, but you know, it's it's really a a fundamental problem. In, in, from a financial perspective that the industry is going to have to, 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 to grasp and get a hold of. Yeah. Well, de-risking, right? I mean, that's sort of the magic word that everybody throws out. But yeah, uh, well said. And, and the, the impact on the industry is obvious um, when that scenario is, uh, that you describe is put in place. Hey, listen, guys, uh, we're going to close this segment and go to a hear from Joe Fargnoli in our New York Minute. But very quickly, this is the lightning round. Uh, you got five seconds each. Rob, I'll start with you. Where do you write? Well, I'll say, oh, where, where do I write? Right in my house. But when do I write? It's typically at night when I'm sort of at my peak intellectual capability, at least historically, that's been the case. Yeah, okay, so you say, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, Tim, how about you? Where Where do you write? You're looking at it right in here, right in my Again, desk. We're, we're in the sanctum. Okay. Uh, Christian, how about you? Uh, same. I'm at my desk. Uh, I get, I have to move around some, so I'll I'll go to my kitchen table, my dining room table, I get restless. I, 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 need, I need a change of scenery. Moves the juices around, huh? Very good. Um, well, again, guys, thank you. We'll come back with some more questions. I noticed chat's been really, really active here. Um, so well, thank you so much for answering these questions. Joe, uh, I noticed you've been taking notes. You're either working on your next book or um, you're hearing some things that, that really stimulated you. So uh, what do you say in the New York Minute? Yeah, thanks, Luke. First of all, I want to thank Tamara for bringing up this subject. We did this last year, and I think it's a really great topic to get creative and imaginative about how we feel about space and what kind of a destiny we see for humanity in space. And I think the idea of thinking about, you know, this as sort of 
stretch out and allow our you know creative juices to flow and think about what is humanity's destiny in space and why go to space. Um, so I really thank Tamara for that uh, for creating this uh, this focus. I also want to thank Christian, Rob, and Tim. Really excellent conversation, and thank you guys for putting out the great work that you put out in this community. It's appreciated and it's impactful. When we think about, though, forming the destiny for where humanity goes in space, it really all comes back to thought. And as we were discussing here, I pulled out a quote from a book called Paris Talks, where it states that the reality of man is his thought, not his material body. If a man's thought is constantly aspiring towards heavenly subject, then does he become saintly. If, on the other hand, his thought does not soar, but is directed downwards to, the, to self, itself upon the things of this world, he grows more and more material until he arrives at a state a little better than that of the animal. So these literary works that drive our thoughts to the what-if world add tremendously. I really appreciated the discussion about rewinding back 10 years ago as to how we were thinking about space and the skepticism that there was about SpaceX at that time. And then having this conversation in juxtaposition of Larry Nevins, Musk, and Bezos, and talking about the, the creative process. I thought the opening video with Nevins was great, talking about how a, a while that idea became the, space def uh, the Strategic Defense Initiative, and how this should give us a little bit of courage and thought to dare greatly and to look admiringly at people like Musk and Bezos and those who want to be like them for their inspiration. You know, this whole idea of daring greatly really means picking up a pen, writing down your ideas, not expecting the world's going to immediately adopt them, but have the courage to believe in one's own thoughts. It brought me to this other document that I read. It's called Letter to the World's Religious Leaders, believe it or not. And it, there's a quote from there that says, when it has been faithful to the spirit and example of the transcendent figures who gave the world its great belief systems, it has awakened in whole populations capacities to love, to forgive, to create, to dare greatly, to overcome prejudice, to sacrifice for the common good, and to discipline the impulses of animal instinct. I think about this in terms of what I think uh, Christian was saying about what is going to propel the next stage or move into space. I personally hope that it's a realignment of our energies and thoughts, allowing us to look at these huge opportunities we have to use a space, use to use space to benefit humanity and to dare greatly. So to close, I just want to say to everybody, I, I, again, I appreciate the example that Christian, Rob, and Tim shared, right? These are not, you know, superheroes. These are people like you and I who've taken the time to believe in their own thoughts, to document them, which we hope more people in that who soar, dare greatly, do not expect to be understood or appreciated immediately in your time or anytime soon, but the world needs you. So I encourage everyone to, to follow this process of planting a thought, reaping an action, from the action, reaping a habit, and from that habit, reaping a destiny. But it all starts with planting a thought. I thank Rob and Tim for planting some great thoughts today. And I know we collectively here want to yield a great destiny for humanity in space. Oh, very nice, Joe. Thank you. Um, daring has always been sort of uh, the hallmark of the industry, right? And, and I think a lot of people do look at our work in the space industry as evolving us as a species to some higher ground that uh, is much better than, than we came from. So uh, I didn't expect you to go in that direction, but you, you always surprise me. Very nice. Uh, thank you. Um, Tamara, I think we've gonna, we're going to talk about the future, speaking of the future, uh, how we're going to be elevated here at SSPI. And then we'll, uh, we'll move on to the Q&A. Uh, space business qualified. Uh, the space business used to be sleepy, but as we hear every month here, it is supercharged now. As we grow, as companies continue to come into being, as you bring on employees from outside the industry, uh, there is a course now that you can give to them and that they can take. Um, it will give them a tutorial uh, online about the business of space. And uh, it is uh, one of our fastest growing products, spacebq.org. And you can take a, a free ride uh, for that. We are beginning, we are launching on August 28th, a, a new series of podcasts and uh, webinars and um, content. Uh, thanks to our friends at Hughes called Eternal Orbit, 
or uh, as uh, we're calling our podcast, I think, Geo 2.0. We're going to be talking now, as we were talking a little bit today, about the evolution of the commercial industry and what is the next generation of geo, uh, geostationary satellites going to bring us? What is it going to look at? Uh, every Monday, uh, we have the SSPI podcast, The Better Satellite World. Uh, is up now, and uh, you'll hear the Geo 2.0 series uh, coming up. And uh, I also encourage you to listen to a uh, periodic podcast that we do called The Road Less Traveled. We've got one up this week where we talk about space burials uh, and uh, a great business uh, that's underway there. It really is. And we've got uh, SSPI Wise uh, meetings coming up. And uh, Tamara, you want to tell us a little bit about what we're going to see on August 31st from uh, SSPI Wise? Sure. So on August 31st, we'll be continuing with the eternal orbit theme. We will be having several companies come and tell us what are their latest projects in geosynchronous orbit. And specifically, we will be hearing from women experts in the field talking about what projects they're working on. So we're looking forward to that conversation on the 31st. It is an open meeting. Everyone is welcome. Thank you. And we'll be picking up next month on the roundtable that uh, GEO 2.0 theme here. So uh, the title there is Show Me the Money. And as I said, we'll be talking about where GEO is headed next. Uh, again, thanks to our friends at Hughes. Okay. Tamara, I'm going to turn it over to you. You've been uh, monitoring chat. It's now your turn to ask uh, our guests questions or to comment yourself on the things that you've heard. Uh, we appreciate you uh, being loyal listeners uh, of the roundtable. So Tamara, over to you. Well, uh, you know, I'm wa watching the chats and I've been having a really uh, engaging conversation with one of our guests, but that's been a private conversation <laughs> on the topic oh, wow. of... of adventurous technology and and uh, and so this session actually you know joe kind of gave us a little mandate um and I, I i you know since i'm not having questions yet from the guests please do put questions if you have any i'll throw the question out there joe let us off with dare greatly um and 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 the the power of thought um, so, so I just want to just throw that out there to the panel. You know, where where are we on this topic of daring greatly? You know, what what what's the one great thought that you want to offer that we can pick up on and run with for I don't know. Let's say the next five years. Go. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um. You know, I guess I would say. We talk a lot in the space world about technology and uh, science and engineering and how those things can accelerate or change uh, our future in space. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's important to think about innovations in things like business models and organization uh, and in financing as well, uh, because all of those things are really vital to enabling the future of the space economy. And I think a lot of what SpaceX has been successful at hasn't just been engineering and hardware, but it's been figuring out how to get paid and when to get paid so that they can actually do things that businesses have not been able to do before. And I actually, I didn't mention this in the very first question, but one of the other reasons to ask if SpaceX was a good idea 10 years ago was because so many people had tried to do that and failed. Uh, and that's another sort of reason to think SpaceX might be unique. Hey, Christian, I want to ask Tamara's question in a, diff in a little bit different, differently um, because it's a great one. When you were writing your book, uh, about the 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 billionaires. Um, what was the greatest act of daring that you came across among that group? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think in for for Elon and Jeff, the idea to start a space company. Um, Elon's is maybe a little bit more well documented um, because of Ashley Vance's first book. But with Jeff, you know, he, he had gone to see a movie um, uh, with Neil Stevenson, the science fiction author. They had gone to see a, um, Rocket Boys based on Homer Hickam's memoir and were having a cup of coffee afterwards. And, and, um, and, and, you know, Jeff turned to Neil and said, you know, I've always wanted to start a space company. And Neil said, well, you should, you should start 
now and just do it. Um, and this was, you know, early on. Um, yeah, I think Blue Origin was founded in uh, 2000, I think, if that's right. And, um, you know, this idea that you could start a space, that's something that you could do, right? And there's um, you know, some similarities between that and, you know, selling books on the internet, that this is something that, you know, is sort of a taking, you know, that maybe people thought was impossible or didn't even think to do and do it. And and how he started the company was not getting into building rockets and engines, but first starting out as a research and development outfit, sort of like a think tank and thinking, you know, just taking a moment, which is a very Jeff way to, you know, approach something and think about it. And the question they were trying to get at is, you know, is a chemically fueled rocket the best way to get to space? Mm -hmm. and, and there are all sorts of other ideas they kicked around and ultimately decided that yes, yes, it is. But and we can't, we can no longer throw the rockets away. So I don't know. I always thought that was, you know, and a story that could serve as a bit of inspiration for, you know, for for dreamers, for entrepreneurs. I mean, obviously, he has a he had even then a fairly large bankroll to support him. So it's a little bit different than having to, you know, invest you know every last dime in your kid's college fund into a venture and relying on parents and relatives. But it was still, I think, you know, a daring bet. Um, see if it pays off. Did it remind you at all of what Rene Anselmo did with Pan Am set many, many years ago when I was just getting into the industry? Because that was I'm not as, as well. He launches a satellite without insurance, which you know, Pan right. guys like Rob. But and aren't there great story. stories about him of decorating his like hometown in Connecticut or something? Someone was telling oh, yeah. me. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to. You know, you have I'm to be crazy, crazy in a way. You have to be a little bit, um, you you know, you have to understand that this is something that, that could completely go under and it may fail. And, you know, I thought even as SpaceX was making, you know, proving itself to be a success and it goes off and starts Starlink. I mean, Elon was like, yeah, I, I know the history here and we may not be able to do this. Uh, I think we can because we have our own rockets and they're reusable and, you know, uh, satellite technology has come a long way, but it may not work. <laughs> right. Um, and I, you know, I, I think there's, there's a, a lot of risk there. Yeah. Yeah. Rob, uh, on the insurance side, as I said, Renee Anselmo basically launched the first, for all practical purposes, commercial satellite business um, without insurance. I mean, he had a partner in Ted Turner. <laughs> It was it was real wild stuff. But um, I want to ask you uh, again to pick up on Tamara's question about daring. Have you ever, you know, in your in your career, have you ever looked at an underwriting deal and sort of said to yourself, you know, I've looked at everything here, but man, this is the biggest risk. This this risk would keep me up at night if it was my industry or my business. What's what's the one that sticks out for you? Well, I mean, there's, uh, I would say there, there's underwriters that dare too much and underwriters that dare too little in, in mm -hmm. my experience, right? I mean, you see what happens to each of them. There's there's a saying that an underwriter once told me that there's there's no such thing as bad risks. There's only bad rates. So if you're going to make the rate high enough, you're going to have a profitable, profitable business no matter what, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think, you know, the, the, the risks that I see in the market is, you know, from, from a commercial perspective, when you're getting new rockets coming down the line and new types of, of satellite platforms and things like that, it's hard sometimes to generate enough capacity from insurers to to insure those risks just because it's not it's it's too risky and the insure the insureds will not buy the insurance once you get past a, a particular price point. I mean, you could easily have a rate of 20 percent plus for a maiden flight of a new launch vehicle and the statistics would show that it's probably even underpriced at that point so most rockets in the first 10 launches they fail you know one to three times almost everywhere in all parts of the world uh, large and small launch vehicles kind of irrespective of any variable you throw at it that's that's a pretty what's the percentage what's the failure percentage one one to three fail in the first mm -hmm. 10 or sorry sorry almost all of them fail one to three times in the first 10 launches so the the first the the failure rate of the first flight of a launch vehicle I think is is over forty percent, right? And 
and then you can talk about well how do you how do you define failure is it an underperformance is it you know, a rocket blowing up so you know there's there's gray areas there's ways to, ways to interpret it um but uh that's some of the the, the market has managed over the years and just insurers just don't provide that much capacity for for new launch vehicles as an example from from a broader perspective i was thinking about the the question that was asked about like how to dare and if i just just to step out of maybe just the, the space industry for a second maybe talk about science in general just thinking in general i would say ha the best way to to dare is to think differently um and i think if you go back it's my opinion if you go back through scientific history and you look at almost every watershed moment it's it's come from uh, an individual who sort of said well i don't care everything that we thought we knew i'm erasing that and i'm looking at it from a different perspective altogether and we need to accept the fact that what we thought we knew we didn't actually know and it was actually a, a great book written about this called um the structure of, of scientific revolutions by thomas kuhn i believe um you know, if you look at Copernicus or Darwin or Einstein, every time they they came up with a you know really a, a gigantic breakthrough in science, they they basically threw out everything that was sort of standardized in terms of intellectual knowledge that the human species had and said, yeah, all of that is wrong. This is the real way of looking at the world. And um, that's that's the best way to dare, I think, intellectually. Joe, you're nodding your head. It, you would probably agree with that. I mean, the four noble truths of Buddhism, who would have thought, right, that this is this is how we actually live our lives and this is how we can be joyful. No one ever thought of that. But you've, you've been around this industry a lot. What's your biggest observation of an act of daring? Joe? Um, quite quickly, I think I agree pretty strongly with Rob. The, the willingness to let go of convention but not for the sake of, you know, the, the expression of ego or self, but the ability to, this is going to sound a little bit strange, but as we, as we read that, you know, previous quote, the, the ability to re-inspire the human spirit with uh, high and noble goals, and from that to realize the history of scientific and mathematical knowledge, it's, it's, potentialities, but it's limitations as well. And to engage in a process of the co-generation of new knowledge. Um, I think as, as, as humans, we've been bred into uh, passivity, into accepting a, a current doctrine, into accepting current ways of thinking. I think community, as a space community, as all communities have, we've struggled to really realize the power that we have to work together to create and co-generate new knowledge and theories. Um, you know, there is a, it's like Eric Fromm, Escape from Freedom. We don't realize the ability we have to, to dare greatly and to reformulate the way we look at science and its application in our society. And I think everywhere, developing that capacity, I think is really an engine of growth for this community as well as others. Yeah. Tamara, you've got your hands up. Uh, you, you're going to close us with your comment. We've we've definitely ended up on higher ground here. Um, it reminds me of the conversation we had with Brother Consul Magno, the Vatican, the head of the Vatican Observatory, who said, I observe space, I do science as an act of worship. Um, I think only in our industry do you get that kind of evolution of thought. But uh, close us out. Take us home. I will. Thank you. I, I want to just share a thought that I was having as I was listening to all of you. Um, you know, we came up on a moment in in the satellite industry where we recognized that humanity was only providing connectivity to half of us, not maybe not even half. And we took a chance. We took a bold vision that we can provide connectivity to the other three billion. That was it. Right. Oh, three B. That was a big deal. And it was visionary, it was exciting, it was humanitarian, and it did not become a very profitable thing, <laughs> not at first. But O3B, because we dared to think that way, is evolving 
And it's going to meet its goals. It's going to succeed. It's already succeeding in expanding the connectivity for humanity. It's becoming profitable. It had to grow and evolve and change in its initial, in its initial uh, output. And so I really love this idea of daring greatly. I love it for our industry. You know, you put the idea out there, it's going to live in the real world. It's going to be changed by the real world, but we're going to grow in the real world if we only dare to do it. So with that, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Rob, for being here. I'm excited for this conversation, and uh, but we are, in fact, out of time. So I'm going to turn this off. <laughs> so thank you all, and I'm waving goodbye. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Joe. We'll see you next month, the third Wednesday of the month, the New York Space Business Roundtable. Enjoy the rest of your summer, everyone. Thanks, Tamara. Thank you.